Diana. Thank you for coming. Good afternoon. Glad you're here. Um, thank you so much for joining us. This is the, and I'm doing some reading here. Uh, this is the sixth um, workshop or panel presentation uh, sponsored by Class Crits Inc. Um, for this year. Um, as, many of you, as many of you know, Class Crits is a membership organization comprised of scholars and um, activists committed to examining and fostering discussions about the largely unexamined relationship between law, economic power, and the intersecting social regimes of inequality, including race, gender, class, among others. In terms of its principles, specifically class crits rejects the theory that insists that economic inequality is an unavoidable result of an impartial market or that economic interests are separate from social identity and politics. Um, it holds that economic class, um, power and inequality is inextricably connected to race and gender hierarchies, along with other social systems of unequal power and um, privilege. Its members believe and demonstrate the ways in which law is central uh, to structuring these um, uh, inequalities. Um, and its members believe and demonstrate uh, um, that um, there might be ways, right? That is, we hold out the hope that law won't forever be in handmaiden to structural inequality um, and thus try to show and propose ways in which the legal obstacles that are present in society, uh, that ways to kind of overcome those and ensure a more just society. Uh, so that's the background of uh, Class Crits, a bit of background on Class Crits. We welcome you to join us and to uh, become a member of the organization. My name is Athena Mutua. Uh, and I am a professor of law in the Floyd H. Um, and Hilda L. Hurst faculty scholar at the University of Buffalo Law School, um, part of the SUNY system. And I am currently also the vice president of the board of Class Crits Inc. So as advertised, we are going to have um, what I think will be in a fabulous discussion about the obstacles and endless microaggressions that women and specifically women of color face in the, in the academy as a workplace. And also the tenacity and creativity that they bring and use and deploy uh, to cope with and overcome these barriers. Although the academy is um, often painted as a kind of bastion of liberalism, as many of us, as many of us know, liberalism has its own identity politics. Um, and that makes it sometimes quite a hostile place for women of color. The obstacles that women of color face comprise a widespread phenomenon, which the authors of the book on which this panel is based characterize as a presumption, a presumption of incompetence. So it's based on the books that they are contributors. They have uh, made uh, written um, uh, chapters for. Uh, the book that we're focusing a bit on today uh, is entitled Presumed Incompetent to Race, Class, Power, and Resistance of Women in Academia. Um, and this is the second volume in the series. The first book entitled Presumed Incompetent, The Intersections of Race and Class for Women in Academia, was published by the University Press of Colorado in 2012. Uh, the second uh, um, um, volume um, was published by the Utah State University Press in 2020. That is to say that the first book was so overwhelmingly popular that folks were asked, that women of color and women from across the country um, asked and, 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 and enticed and begged uh, the editors of this book to do a second edition. Um, they clamored so much for a, a second, not a second edition, a second book uh, that they sent in hundred, hundreds of stories to be included in this 
uh, book two of presumed incompetent. And of course, not all of the uh, uh, entries could be selected. Uh, nevertheless, the book contains stories, statistics, and analyses surveying almost all act, um, aspects of academic life, including the campus climate for women of color, faculty and student relations, social class in the academy, uh, the, of course, the tenure and promotion process among others. And this second volume also includes a special section on um, women in academic leadership, deanships, uh, et cetera, as well as a special chapter on activism and resistance. The information is delivered with rigor and with grace and a great deal of humor. So today we're lucky because we have as part of this panel, one of the co-editors of the book and several of the contributors to the book. And they're gonna provide us some insight into this presumption of incompetence phenomenon. Um, unfortunately, Mira Dio could not be with us um, today, but all the others are present and accounted for. Um, and so I think we have a great uh, discussion in store for you. So let me turn the floor over to the panelists. One housekeeping note, we are going to be taking questions from the audience after all of the presentations. And we hope to leave about 30, maybe hopefully 40 minutes for audience questions. We're gonna ask you to raise your hand through Zoom. So figure out kind of the uh, Zoom function that allows you to raise your hand and we'll take questions and, and you can begin. So our first speaker, our first speaker is Professor, Professor Carmen G. Gonzalez. She is the Morris I. Liebman Professor of Law at Loyola University Chicago School of Law. Uh, Professor Gonzalez is one of the editors of both books. Um, and she's gonna talk to us about the presumed incompetent project as a whole. And she may also provide us an overview of uh, the uh, participation of people of color and women of color in um, the profession and the legal academy in particular. So Professor Gonzalez, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, as I was listening to you, I was thinking we should hire you as our publicist. I really loved everything that you had to say about the book. Um, in order to give people some visuals, let me share my screen. Okay. So here you have the, the cover of Presumed Incompetent. I'm one of the editors of Presumed Incompetent 2. Race, Class, Power, and Resistance of Women in Academia, along with my colleague, Gabriela Gutierrez y Mus, and my colleague, Yolanda Flores Niman. Presumed Incompetent to discusses the challenges that female faculty of color encounter in the academic workplace in a variety of disciplines. This panel is going to feature the law professor contributors to Presumed Incompetent, but the stories that they will share and that I will share are cross-cutting. What we found is that the commonalities in the experiences of women of color far outweighed the disciplinary differences. As Athena explained, presumed incompetent is actually part of a project. It is the second in a series of book. The first book, Presumed Incompetent, the Intersections of Race, uh, of Race and Class for Women in Academia was published in 2012 and it became an academic bestseller selling over 10,000 copies. Every time we spoke about the book, women told us our stories and said, are you doing a second volume? I have a story to tell and I am now inspired to tell my story. So we decided that the time was ripe to do the second volume. We put out a call for papers. We invited women that we, that we had already met who we knew had a story to tell. Um, and the second volume came into being. I wanna set the stage though by talking about numerical representation in academia, because the problem begins with the numbers. According to the National Center of Education Statistics, over 75% of full-time faculty members in all disciplines are white. 
less than 25% are people of color. The statistics for legal academia are worse. According to the American Bar Association, 81% of law faculty are white, 19% are people of color. The ABA statistics indicate that 9% of law professors are women of color. The Association of American Law Schools estimates this number at 7%. Regardless of which number is correct, the takeaway lesson is the same the numbers are very low. According to the Census Bureau, women of color represent approximately 20% of the US population. Our numbers in academia are very small relative to that number. Then we get to the legal profession. The legal profession remains one of the least racially diverse professions in the US. In 2020, the ABA reported that 86% of all attorneys in the United States are white. Worst of all, this number has not budged in 10 years. In the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and many others, students are clamoring for universities to grapple with systemic racism and embrace anti-racist pedagogy. However, many universities and law schools are unprepared to meet this challenge due in part to the underrepresentation of faculty of color, faculty who share this pedagogical objective, faculty whose research and life experiences have prepared them to incorporate race, gender, class, indigeneity, sexual orientation, disability, and other subordinated identities into their teaching. The personal narratives and empirical studies in Presumed Incompetent II shed light on the reasons for those low numbers and on best practices for creating opportunities for women of color to thrive and to lead in academia. So what are some of the barriers? Implicit bias in the hiring process. White faculty still constitute the majority of US faculty, and when they're asked to hire the most qualified candidates, they often select candidates who look very much like themselves. There's a name for this, the cloning effect. Lack of mentoring. As with hiring, faculty tend to mentor colleagues who share their identities, leaving women of color to flounder and fend for themselves. Devaluation of scholarship on race and gender especially qualitative empirical scholarship or community-based research. Overwhelming service obligations. Women of color are often asked to be the voice of gender and racial diversity on multiple committees and also engage in an enormous amount of invisible service in the form of student mentoring. Lack of transparency and tenure and promotion standards, which allow implicit bias to flourish race and gender bias in teaching evaluations, which can and have undermined the careers of many faculty of color. And then finally, class bias in academia. I wanna spend the rest of my time thinking about class bias in academia because this is a panel sponsored by Class Grids and how class intersects with race and gender in the academic workplace. I wanna start with some information that is well known to law faculty, maybe less well known to those in other um, areas of academia. And that is what are the hiring criteria for law school faculty and how might class bias be embedded in this? When hiring tenure track faculty, most law schools strongly prefer candidates who graduated from a top 12 law school, Yale and Harvard are way overrepresented. Um, served on law review, were on the top 10% of their class, had a prestigious judicial clerkship, um, completed a, uh, a competitive fellowship program, has another, someone who has, another, has a PhD in another discipline, and already has a track record of scholarly publications. Just as the LSAT disproportionately weeds out low-income students and students of color, these criteria create enormous barriers to entry excluding the vast majority of law school graduates from tenure track teaching positions. Women of color from working class backgrounds are less likely to attend high schools that are Ivy League feeder schools, to receive mentoring to attend elite universities and to have the financial resources to do so. 
Even the ones who do graduate from elite institutions are often burdened with student loans and may not be able to afford to do a relatively low paid judicial clerkship or a fellowship or to obtain a PhD in a different discipline. So class bias is baked into the system through the hiring criteria. But class bias also plays an important role in the lived experience of women of color in academia. In the United States, people living in poverty are stigmatized and they're blamed for their own predicament. Women of color from working class backgrounds are often warned by trusted mentors that they should not talk about the economic hardships they overcame because their colleagues will look down on them. Two minutes. There's, there's, ooh, I'm gonna talk fast. There's a <laughs> feel shame about their family's poverty. Like it's their problem that they didn't overcome the barriers. And I say this as someone who's, who is the child of immigrants who worked blue collar jobs, did not speak English and did not have the opportunity to study beyond the fifth grade. Women of color are supposed to assimilate to white middle and upper class norms and perform middle class patterns of speech, um, of dress, where they live, what they read, how they communicate, to code switch constantly. And if they don't code switch, if they're blunt, if they're candid instead of middle-class passive aggressive, they pay a penalty. Female faculty of color find themselves in an, un, in an uncharted territory if they come from the working class, a place filled with arcane rituals that were never explained. They also experience greater economic hardship because the disparities between men and women and white faculty and faculty of color in salaries take a particularly huge toll on women who are burdened with student loans, who are struggling to pay for childcare, who may be helping to support parents, siblings, and other family members, and who are not likely to inherit any wealth from their families. I wanna conclude on a positive note. Women of color, from working class backgrounds also have something very important to contribute to academia. And that is we have experience with organizing and collective struggle. This was the key to survival. This is something we learned from our families in order to be able to survive in inhospitable work environments that were never meant to support us. We know how to form alliances with those who share our values and who may not share our identities. Women of color from poor or working class backgrounds also have empathy for students who are struggling with poverty, who can't afford their textbooks, who are food insecure, who are living in their cars, who are undocumented, who are so preoccupied with survival that they can barely concentrate on their studies. Universities often operate on a deficit model that depicts poor people as a problem to be solved. Every decade, universities collaborate with UN agencies to develop new strategies to solve the problem of poverty. But women of color from the working class understand that the problem is not, is the rich, not the poor. The problem is an economic system that entrenches racial and gender inequality, enables the affluent to hoard wealth and opportunity and redistributes income from the poor to the rich through many mechanisms, including the tax code and predatory lending. One of the greatest strengths that women of color from the working class bring to legal education is our ability to develop an intersectional class conscious analysis that pays attention to systemic injustice. This understanding informs our teaching, it informs our scholarship and also the collective work that we do to transform legal education. So in closing, the contributors to Presumed Incompetent to validate the experiences of women of color in academia. They share their struggles and their victories, and they give us the tools to dismantle the structural barriers that stand in our way. Thank you so much, um, Carmen. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Gonzalez. Um, um, and I'm glad you focused on, on, on class a bit. I, I thought that was very fascinating. Let me ask you a quick question. I wanna keep us moving. Quick question is, how did you get into this? What was your objective? Why? Uh, I remember you talking about this in 2010. Mm -hmm. 
What was the goal? Briefly. Sure. I came to academia after practicing law for 10 years. And what really struck me is that the basic workplace norms that we take for granted elsewhere and other jobs just didn't apply. Um, the, the ambiguity of the promotion and tenure standards, for example, the fact that it was a sliding scale depending upon who you were evaluating and no one could actually figure out what, what the criteria were. This was appalling to me. I encountered a level of racism from students and faculty that I had not experienced as a practicing attorney. So I was it stunned for the longest period of time trying to figure out what was going on. It's, a, it's amazing that I survived. I was also traumatized by seeing colleagues who did not survive. That traumatized me more than anything that happened to me personally. And so uh, I approached my, my colleague um, at my former institution and we decided to go forward with this project and reached out to others so that women in the future would have at least some sort of roadmap, some sense that they are not alone, a sense of what the common obstacles are and most, most importantly, the strategies for dealing with the obstacles. Thank you, thank you. Um, let me push us. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Gonzalez. Um, our next speaker um, is Professor Sahar Aziz. Um, and Professor Aziz is the Professor of Law, the Chancellor's Social Justice Scholar, the Middle East Legal Studies Scholar, and director of the Center for Security, Race, and Rights at Rutgers Law School. Uh, Professor Aziz will discuss the cultural norms, something that you kind of ended with, uh, uh, Professor Gonzalez. Uh, she's, gonna, uh, she's gonna be talking about the cultural norms um, in the academy and, and in law schools in particular, and their impact on women of color. Well, thank you so much. Thank you to Class Kuritz. Thanks to my co-panelists. I'm, I'm very honored to be uh, on this panel. And thank you for all the participants who took time out of their busy schedules. Yeah. So my contribution to the book, uh, the, the chapter is called The Alpha Female and the Sinister Seven, Intentionally uh, Provocative. Yes. <laughs> so yes. when, when I decided to contribute to Presumed Incompetent 2, a litany of bad experiences came to mind, ranging from outright assaults on my job security and attempts to threaten my tenure process to the daily microaggressions that remind you every day, no matter how hard you work, no matter how many awards you get and how frequently your work is cited, you are and will remain at the bottom of the gender and racial hierarchy undergirding American society in general, but the legal academy in particular. So as an academic, I couldn't resist developing a topology of the various characters in forms of racism, sexism, and Islamophobia that I experienced in the academy. Now, in attempting to understand the contradiction between law's stated commitments to civility, ethics, and integrity on the one hand, and the depraved behavior of some faculty towards some female professors of color on the other hand, I realized that my situation is unique insofar as I identify or self-identify as a particular type of woman the alpha female. Thus, I am marked as a triple outsider, a woman, a racial, ethnic, and religious minority, and an alpha personality in a profession that expects leadership and intelligence and confidence from its members, and yet penalizes women and minorities for possessing such traits. So despite the common usage of the alpha male to, demote, to denote masculinity, leadership, charisma, and social aggressiveness, all traits admired in men, particularly in the legal profession, there is no recognition, much less desire, for the female counterpart. So the dearth of literature about alpha females produces what I think is a blind spot in the socio-legal analysis on gender equality. So my chapter seeks to incorporate the concept of the alpha female into my experiences as a woman of color in the legal academy, who is not only presumed incompetent because of my immutable racial and ethnic characteristics, but also presumed aggressive rather than driven and focused and insolent rather than confident and competent because my alpha personality traits for which my white male counterparts receive promotions to leadership positions and accolades are in, in essence uh, liability for me and other women like me. Now it was not until I began studying identity performance that I had an epiphany about why some men and women with whom I interacted found me to be an anomaly at best or threatening at worst. Although I dress like a traditionally feminine woman and I am heterosexual, 
I'm confident, ambitious, outspoken, and I exude a sense of entitlement to be treated like my similarly situated white peers. That is, I commit the ultimate sin for a woman of color in a white male dominated society. I behave and expect to be treated like an alpha white male. In many higher education institutions, alpha characteristics in male professors are unofficially treated as a prerequisite for the job. The literature defines the alpha male as a dominant, driven, and confident extrovert. He is charismatic, a high achiever, and has a sense of mission. The alpha male does not shy away from his expressing his opinion in faculty meetings, the classroom, or public debates. His degrees, work experience, and publications earn him full membership in the nation's intellectual elite and in turn deference by students, staff, and colleagues. And when the alpha male works hard, he expects to be rewarded with higher pay, endowed chairs, and awards. He knows the capitalist system exploits those who allow themselves to be exploited. And as a result, self-advocacy and self-promotion is smart, not selfish. He asks for what he wants because he is convinced that he deserves it. As a man in a patriarchal society, the alpha male's actions are respected as smart and rational. So where does this leave the alpha female in the legal academy? What if this alpha female is also a racial or ethnic minority? The few sociological studies on alpha females define her, quote, as a woman who reports being a leader, feeling a sense of superiority or dominance over other females, having others seek her guidance, feeling extroverted in social situations, believing that males and females are equal, and feeling driven. Another definition is, quote, a self-assured, goal-driven, competitive high achiever who maintains egalitarian beliefs and does not perceive any distinction between herself and her male counterparts. So these traits earn the alpha female the reputation of leadership and respect, and the alpha female a reputation of being arrogant, inconsiderate, and aggressive. So my story is that of the alpha female of color, a person simultaneously attracted to the legal profession, but yet rebuked by many of its members, particularly in the legal academy. In a society where being an outspoken, outspoken smart, driven, and confident woman of color gets you a ticket into the gendered bitch club and the raced angry woman troublemaker club. Practicing law can actually be a reprieve, but the academy uh, was, not, was not at all like the practice as Professor Carmen had suggested. Uh, because instead, women whose alpha temperaments refute gender stereotypes of the good woman as docile, deferential, accommodating, perpetually pleasant, and self-sacrificing are then penalized. Two minutes. Okay. So let me just quickly jump to the next section. Um, so I entered the Legal Academy with numerous ideas for student-focused events, research, and ways to make law schools not only more diverse, but welcoming to underrepresented minorities. Naively thinking a law school was similar to a law firm with an institutional mission implemented by faculty and staff, I immediately began sharing my ideas with colleagues and looking for collaborators with similar interests. I assumed there were incentives to share information and work together in support of each other's work because individual accomplishment collectively contributes towards institutional success. I also assumed there would be disincentives to hoard information or obstruct your colleagues' work. My assumptions were woefully incorrect. The legal academy is structurally rife with passive aggressive behavior, dishonesty, duplicity, and backstabbing, all of which I find to be unprofessional and uncivil, no matter how much of these same colleagues smile in your face or include feigned niceties in their emails. The jealousies and insecurities that drive some faculty to sabotage their colleagues' initiatives, particularly when they're women of color, to quash creative new ideas, engage in ad hominem attacks, impede collaborative work, and oppose transparency is a form of professional malpractice and incivility that occurs so frequently that it is now accepted as normal in faculty engagement, while those who are honest, forthright, blunt, and transparent in their disagreements or critiques with colleagues become the targets of quote-unquote incivility campaigns by the very people whose modus operandi is stealth sabotage, information hoarding, duplicity, and bad faith. So ultimately, the term civility and professionalism become arbitrary concepts weaponized to discipline alpha minority professors. Now, by the time I was up for tenure, I realized I was not like many other law professors, not simply because of my minority racial and religious background, but also because of my willingness to act consistent with my alpha personality. I was outspoken, blunt, confident, not deferential to male authority, emulated white men who self-promoted their work and had no aversion to confronting and resolving disagreements. And like others before me, I soon discovered the tenure and promotion process more of a popularity contest than a meaningful evaluation of merit based on, based on clearly communicated, equally applied objective criteria. Now, fortunately, I was 
lucky to have gained tenure. And frankly, it's somewhat of a surprise in hindsight, but I know that there are many other women who have not. And so I'll end by just quickly listing the seven prototypes, which you'll have to read the chapter to get the details on, to give you an idea of the type of behavior that I really think is just unacceptable, or at least uh, may not necessarily be ill-intended or with bad intention, but certainly is creating these structural inequalities against uh, women of color in general, but, but women of color who have what we call alpha or type A personalities. So they are number one, the troll, number two, the patriarchal female. Yes, we are our own worst enemies as women in the patriarchal system sometimes. The whispering coward, the head minority man in charge, the liberal hypocrite, which is highly overrepresented in the legal academy, where there are many people who are liberals and will write about liberal ideas and who will go on panels and speak about uh, liberal and social justice issues, but in how they deal with their own colleagues who are women of color is anything but liberal. Uh, the stealth pervert and the misogynist racist. And individuals can be multiple prototypes at the same time. Some individuals exemplify a prototype much more intensely like uh, than others. But like any theoretical frame, it is not flawless, nor does it explain every experience of incivility, abuse, or discrimination. But I do hope that critiques of my theory and critiques of my topology will motivate socio-legal empiricists to explore the ways in which civility and professionalism are weaponized against male and female professors of color who either refuse or, or are simply incapable of performing their identities to accommodate patriarchal and white racial dominance in the legal academy. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Aziz. I have to tell you, the chat room is jumping off over here. Folks are saying, preach. <laughs> Somebody said, Aunt Lydia. <laughs> uh, so uh, people are really responding to, uh, uh, to your, uh, to, to your uh, description and to your uh, analysis. Um, well, let me ask you to a quick question, give me a few more minutes. And, 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 and this question may actually answer itself. So it may not be a good one, uh, but 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 I love the description of the alpha female, and and I agreed as you described in your chapter that uh, we even have you know these kind of white fem feminists you know self described uh, uh, feminists who can be foot soldiers for patriarchy and they can also be uh, foot soldiers for white supremacy, um, and and with regard to race you know they say in my neighborhood uh, uh, all skin ain't kin. Um, so, but I was wondering, how do you position yourself when you have an alpha man of color who's an ally, but who is subject to attacks by what I call the Amy Coopers of the world, right? Um, and so when we think about uh, Amy Cooper, we think about this Amy Cooper is a woman in the Central Park uh, who people say, well, you know, she was angry because this guy told her to leash her dog, but she was really angry when she walked up and told him to put that camera away <laughs> and stop taping her, uh, taping her. And so kind of how, what does, how does the alpha uh, uh, female of color, right? Woman of color interact with this kind of alpha male of color. Who's so that, is that is a, a major intersectionality issue. Issue, right. You no, know, this was a big issue among African-American women during the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. It's a big issue among Muslim women in the post 9-11 environment where our communities were being literally attacked from every external source. Mm -hmm about uh, on Islamophobia and yet we do and we did and we do have gender inequality and patriarchy within our own minority communities. And so it's this perennial struggle, right, of the minority woman feminist in particular, who's trying to figure out how do you liberate yourself and your fellow women in the community without giving, um, without giving weapon or ammunition to outsiders who would love anything more than to figuratively and politically castrate your men. Right? And so, and this is where I have the head minority in charge topology and it's really the hardest one to deal with. And I, I will just talk about, you know, I'm Muslim and I'm Arab. And so two things I'll say. The first is when I put this in the chapter, my personality traits, now a lot of it is genetic, but it's quite nurtured. 
And my, um, my identity performance, my authentic identity performance is absolutely a direct result of how I was raised by my Arab Muslim father. And I wanna say that because a lot of American feminists are constantly trying to save us Arab women and save us Muslim women. Okay, we don't need to be saved, trust me. There are so many strong Arab Muslim women in that region that it's, it makes me feel like a mouse uh, when I go visit, you know, when I go visit home. So, so a lot of that is socialization, but what I try to do is I try to give multiple second, third, fourth chances to my colleagues. I try to um, forgive a lot and it's only out and I try to have conversations with them that I otherwise probably wouldn't have if they were members of the majority group. So giving them maybe giving them great, being graceful a bit and talking to them. But there have been situations where I realize that for whatever reason, they just cannot disconnect the way that they are oppressed, which they recognize as minority men, from the way that they oppress me, right, as a woman of color. Mm -hmm. And at that point, unfortunately, we, we have to part our own ways and I have to treat them um, in a way where, you know, you have to be guarded, you can't trust them, and, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, they're not an ally. But it's like you said, what, what was the saying that you said? All, <laughs> all kin ain't skin. All skin ain't kin. <laughs> so sometimes it's it's, but I but I do try to take the time at least to explain the intersectionality argument and say, do you see what's happening here? I am trying really hard to work with you because I don't want to be part of the, the patriar the sexism against you as a minority man. But if he doesn't want to listen, well, too bad. That's the way it is. Wonderful. Thank you so much <laughs> for taking a moment and, and answering that. Let me. Um, let me push forward um, and turn to um, my very good friend, Professor Adrian Wing. Um, uh, Professor Wing is the Bessie Dutton Murray, Murray uh, Professor of Law and the Associate Dean for International Programs at the University of Iowa. Uh, College of Law. Um, and she's going to be discussing, um, kind of looking at the other spectrum. She's going to be talking about retirement um, and the end of uh, career uh, life um, issues um, and, and telling us a little bit about what happens to us uh, when we spend, uh, maybe she'll touch on this, I don't know, uh, a time in, in environments for years and years that might be a bit hostile. I hope she touches on that. But anyway, uh, Professor Wing, please take it away. Thank you very much, Athena. Uh, I am delighted to be here with everyone. This is my first class crit conference. So I am grateful to Zoom for the ability to be here. And of course, I want to thank everyone from Class Crits for having this wonderful event. I would also like to thank my sisters uh, from the presumed incompetent book. Uh, Carmen um, uh, invited me to participate in both volumes. Mm -hmm. And it's one of my favorite gifts that I give to my friends who are entering the profession. Uh, and I saw in the chat, some of you are interested, are gonna buy the, buy the book. Mm -hmm. And then Sahar and Laura, uh, it's been wonderful to participate with you all in discussing this book in various venues. Um, in terms of approaching this um, from a class crit perspective, we have to acknowledge we are all globally privileged. The fact that we are professors, many of us who have a tenured job, most of the time that tenured job means we will not be terminated, although we've seen schools that have shut and efforts that are made to terminate tenured people. But relatively speaking, compared to most black people in the world, most women in the world, we are globally privileged. So what do we do with that global privilege when in our heart, I'm still that young woman who was in the anti-apartheid movement and the civil rights movement and was on the front line and couldn't have imagined the career that I've had where I've been a law professor of over 30 years. And when I thought what I could write for this volume uh, of Presumed Incompetent, I decided I would write about the end of career, the end of work life, because most articles are about the beginning of career, getting tenure, getting promotion, et cetera. 
So in my chapter, I tackle a few issues. Uh, the first part is love is all there is. The second is spirit injuries can fester until the end of life. The third is privileging multiplicity. How do we handle that? And the last part is the struggle is my life. Now, despite the discrimination that I have faced in my career and continue to face, I would do it all again. I have learned and I feel the law can have soul, the law can have heart, and I feel this more strongly than ever, especially after we've come out or are trying to come out of the Trump era, which is going to be lasting for quite a long time. I have stated when the bombs are dropping, literally or figuratively, you have to keep calm and carry on, which is literally what the British said when they were being bombed by the Nazis. So we have to look that we're in this battle, uh, a battle of our lives, and we're going to still be in it, whether the president is Joe Biden and the vice president is Sister Kamala Harris. So I have some lessons I would like to leave with you in my limited time talking about the end of career. Uh, Black women in particular, we have no wealth. We have zero, we have negative number wealth even though we may have a job that gives us <clears throat> a privileged salary, relatively speaking. So one of the things we have to focus on is what are we going to do about that situation? How can we pay down or pay off debt? I'm still paying debt of student loans. I paid off my own and now I'm paying for some of my children, even though they borrowed as well. And I'm very interested in whether some of this is going to get forgiven. So I want to pay off that debt because when I die, I don't want to be in the situation of a lot of my relatives where my children are going to inherit debt that they have to deal with. Not the student loan debt, <laughs> but other debt that I will have accumulated. So we have to figure out how do we get rid of that debt so that we're not leaving a burden for our children. Another lesson is how can we deal with the ongoing intersectionality of the impact of the racism, gender discrimination, class discrimination, and now ageism and health discrimination when we have all of these in the form of spirit injury. So of course now everyone looking at COVID and how that illustrates once again that people of color, black people, black women in particular are disproportionately affected themselves, their families and so forth. And yet the system doesn't care about that. But we who are in the academy, we who have the ability to talk and speak in our op-eds and other things that some of you have done quite eloquently have to figure out how are we gonna focus on on that and it's going to be a problem but I know we're up to this challenge. Another lesson is um, how do we deal with the literal threats to our lives? I don't know about you all, my children told me I needed to get an alarm system in my house that I hadn't had to have in Iowa City, Iowa because of these right-wing terrorists that are running around and would love to assassinate and eliminate us. We are the very essence of what they are afraid of. And that's not going away, right? And a lot of them have military training. They have various types of arms. And so we have to figure out what are we going to do about that, each one of us. I got these cameras. It's like, that's not going to stop anybody from killing me. <laughs> but at least maybe they'll look at the camera and they'll be able to track down, like they did at the Capitol, track down some of the people who were involved in whatever could happen. Of course, I hope that doesn't happen, but it could. Another issue, how to stay engaged after your retirement. You may be fed up and say, I don't wanna deal with those people anymore. In addition to emeritus teaching, you may decide to get involved with some of the alumni groups or other groups that are at your former institution or where you yourself went to school. I think we all should consider donating to various causes related to the school if we want to help the students. So for instance, when I turned 60, I started the Adrian Wing Study Abroad Fund. I started it with $100,000. Everybody said, oh my, how did you get 100,000? It's called term life insurance. <laughs> term life insurance that came with my benefits. And so I designated that and it was a big announcement and people, students came to me and they said, how do I get the Wing Award? I said, oh, I have to die. 
I have to die, right? So I'm like, okay, that's not going to work. <laughs> so I have them take out a certain amount of money out of each paycheck. And that is accumulating to $6,000 a year, which is about the interest that might have been on the 100000 And that money is going aimed at predominantly students of color to either study abroad or work abroad. Anyone who's been abroad knows you do that, it changes your whole life. And I want students to have that opportunity, which I didn't have when I was in school, in order that they can literally open themselves to the world and hopefully it becomes part of what their work is. Also, don't get depressed. I know it's so hard. I think we're all suffering from traumatic stress syndrome, not post, but we are in active stress syndrome. So I want you to think about a couple of things. There's a saying by Dylan Thomas, do not go gently into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Remember that? And also I'm always inspired by brother Nelson Mandela. His autobiography was entitled, The Struggle Is My Life. He wrote that when he was in prison and he didn't know if he was gonna be in prison forever. He didn't know he's gonna be the first black president. So we in our lifetimes are not gonna end sexism, racism, classism, homophobia, Islamophobia, or any of the isms that we have struggled against in our life. We will be, we will be judged by the nature and quality of that struggle that we will have engaged in. So don't get depressed get out there, get working, continue, and know that people will see she worked as hard as she could, she gave as much as she could, and still we will rise. Thank you. Fabulous, thank, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna drop the name's Adrian. Uh, that was wonderful. Um, and you, you checked us. We are, remind, you reminded us, we are in privileged um, positions and we can do something even as we fight. Um, um, while also talking a little bit, quite a bit about a spirit injury. And I wanna, I wanna go there. I, I first wanna say, I love the beginning of your chapter, love is all there is. I think I was in tears, love is all there is. Um, so wonderful, um, but then you go on and you talk about a little bit about uh, spirit, uh, spirit inj um, injury. Um, and um, so I have a quick question for you. Don't wanna take a whole lot of time, but I guess the short of it is, and I'll expand a moment, is how do you deal with the threats to life and health posed by the bias um, that we face in our academic careers, uh, even though we're in very senior status, for instance, in your chapter, you list the premature death of so many of our colleagues. You just list names. And we know so many of these people. Um, and then you mentioned the early onset, onset of Alzheimer's uh, disease um, in Lonnie Guineer and Charles Ogletree. We know these people. Uh, um, both of those are um, law professors. Um, so I guess my question is, um, um, how might we better deal with what I think is a heightened level of stress? So you've given us some tools of kind of how to uh, fight to the end, uh, but, but how, do we, how, how do we deal with this kind of, so I think about last semester, I can think of four incidences uh, that were just kind of outrageous, but that's every semester. Mm -hmm. Any ideas? Yeah, you know, obviously all the things I was saying are part of that, part of that yeah. but you know, so many of us, we work so hard and I'm one of those people, we don't know how to relax at all. Right. And so I think we have to do a better job uh, at, at carving out little bits of time. Um, you know, and this links into love is all there is. My partner who you know, James Somerville, I've known him 40 years. Our relationship recycled. We've been back together 25 years. So one of the de-stressing things we do at night is we watch Star Trek. <laughs> We're like Trekkies. Star Trek. And mm -hmm. Star Trek is about, you know, about diversity and about international law. And so we will spend this time together. And it's a bonding, a bonding event. We can't go out, you know, hanging out, partying, doing things that we might have done at some point in life. But spending that time together, um, we bought this this massage chair, like I don't know, ten years ago. It was just collecting dust. 
I said, I can't go to get a massage. You know, I'm not going to subject myself to COVID chances, but I actually used the chair. It worked. Uh, and, you know, it's like, okay, wow, I can do this. And then we started doing yoga in the house, right? I used to pay, go out and pay. And so uh, I write poetry. I hadn't written any in years. I started writing my poetry again. For each one of us, it's going to be different things and at different phases of life. But we have to carve in something. And then since we don't know what's going to happen to us, right, if we're going to die at 50 or 55 or get Alzheimer's, which my mother and grandmother did, right, that we have to know, okay, I've got to do as much as possible because I, I may not have 90 years or 86 years um, that some, some groups of people have. I may not be as fortunate as, uh, you know, Cecily Tyson to live to 90, 90 something years yes. old. Yeah, but it. I'll do what I can and, and take these nuggets. I call them uh, their spirit injury and their spirit warming. So these are all elements of spirit warming that are essential for us as we continue to fight various uh, battles. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um, and so let me push it. Let me turn. These have been uh, fabulous. Uh, to it. Let me turn to our last uh, speaker. Um, I'll tell you a bit about her, Professor Laura, Laura Padilla, uh, is a professor of law at the California Western School of Law. Uh, and she's going to discuss the unique challenges faced by women of color who are academic leaders or who are seeking to be academic leaders, those deans, those provosts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, I turn the floor over to you, Laura. Let me get my share screen up. It is a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, afternoon for me, evening for some of you. It's a pleasure and a privilege to sit on this panel with intelligent women who have raised important issues that require ongoing attention. And when Carmen was introducing uh, the day or the, the panel and uh, why Presumed Incompetent 2 came about, you know, my first thought was like, wouldn't it be nice if we didn't need a presumed incompetent three, but these ongoing issues that we are facing, um, I think are going to be with us for some time, even with our best work. I also want to thank the, the class crit organizers. Thanks for inviting us for doing a beautiful job uh, putting this together for the participants. I see a couple of my Cal Western students, Maddie and Maru are out there. Thank you for joining us today. So I have been interested in the relationship between gender, race, and power for a while. And I think part of that, I think, I don't know if you're going to ask this later, but you know, what, what initiated that? I think growing up poor, you know, poor woman of color, I was very curious when I got to, to college, I went to Stanford and went to law school there and you're around people that, that come from like some crazy money. Like how, how does this shape you? How does this impact you? So I've been interested in the relationship between gender, race, and power. In 2006, I wrote a gendered update on women law deans, which examined the number of women law deans at AALS member schools, including women of color. And it reported that in the 2005-2006 period, there were 31 women law deans at the then 166 AALS member schools. 18.7% of all law deans were women, only three of the 31 women, or 1.8% of all law deans were women of color. In 2019, I completed an update to that original article and a chapter focusing just on women of color serving as law deans is in presumed incompetent too. So what changed in the roughly 12 years between articles? On the bright side, there are a lot more women law deans. What hasn't changed? Women, especially women of color, face many of the same challenges, including presumptions of incompetence and gender sidelining. Mm -hmm. So in my time, I'm going to report on the numbers, describe some of the ongoing hurdles that women law deans continue to face, including examples women provided in a survey I sent to all law deans, Time permitting, I'll close with some strategies to address the hurdles and preserve sanity, or maybe um, we can get to that during the Q&A. <clears throat> so the number of women law deans has steadily increased since the first woman was appointed way back in 1898. 
summer 2019 when I was doing edits on my article, excluding interim deans, because I, I don't like to count them in the numbers because of their temporary status, roughly 31.5% of deans at the then 203 ABA schools were women. Today, a mere two years later, I think I think this is good news, but I'm gonna I'm gonna put an asterisk and come back to it. A mere two years since doing the edits on that article, the percentage has increased to 36%. That's a pretty big jump in two years. Um, there are also more women of color serving as law deans. In summer 2019, about 9.1% of women, uh, of law deans were women of color at ABA schools. That's jumped to 14.5% in two years, which is a pretty radical jump. And at AALS schools, you can see that the numbers jumped in the last couple of years from eight, roughly 8.6% to 13.3%. So clearly there has been progress since 2006 when there were only three women deans of color, women law deans of color. Some other bright spots since 2005, five Latinas have been appointed as deans as well as the first Native American and first Asian American women. So why do we have more law deans now? There's certainly more gender parity in law school, which leads to more women law school graduates and professors. And that is definitely the pool from which most deans are selected. We've had some exceptional leaders who have developed tools to create pathways to deanships for women, for people of color, and really for outsiders generally. Perhaps more cynically, and this is the asterisk that I uh, put in a moment ago, law school deanships are no longer the plum positions they once were. And I think you can consider even just in the last year what we've gone through with COVID and the way uh, leaders have had to pivot, you know, certainly monthly, sometimes weekly. Uh, and, you know, that that's challenging. And as positions become more challenging, we seem to find that doors open more, right, for people like us. Um, so to get a sense of whether and what challenges remain for women in leadership positions. I sent uh, surveys to uh, deans, uh, to women of color, women, men, in two waves in the spring and fall of 2018. And here you can see numbers of how many recipients, responses, so on and so forth. Um, many women who responded to the survey and some men asked that their responses to questions about personal experiences be reported anonymously. Two minutes. Challenges. So the survey asked law deans whether they had experiences where they were presumed incompetent. While some women said no, the overwhelming majority said they had such experiences, as did the one man of color who responded. One woman of color bluntly said she was presumed incompetent, quote, all the time by colleagues, students, when I was on the bench. It's ingrained in many until you have the opportunity to demonstrate your expertise. Mm -hmm. A recently appointed woman of color wrote, I have a board member who constantly remarks at board meetings. Well, I don't know whose idea this was, but it was a terrific one. I bet it was the Admiral's idea to which she responds. Actually, it was my idea which was then implemented by staff. The board member always seemed surprised. The presumption of incompetence underlying this response to this woman of color um, is basically, how could she be an innovative leader? Innovations must come from her subordinate team members. The reality is she had eight years of experience as a law school administrator before becoming Dean, including documented innovative leadership. During her callback interview, her ability to raise money was questioned. A board member also asked about her level of comfort with the military, a major presence in the law school's home city, and her ability to, to resonate with this group of poten potential donors. So it's basically a projection that this Black woman is not going to be comfortable with fundraising or the military. Her response, my father was in the Air Force. Board member's response, oh, an enlisted man? Dean Candidate's response? No, an Air Force pilot stationed at Andrews Air Force Base from which the US president flies. Board member's response, surprise again. And I'll wrap up by, by some of what is packed into that exchange. 
including assumptions about a black woman's unfamiliarity with dealing with powerful white men, when the reality is she was educated in a major majority white suburban school district, like many of us went to a very white college, a very white law school, big white law, and the legal academy. And we know what the composition of that is like. Another assumption is if her dad was in the military as a man of color, he must have been a low ranking grunt. The reality, he was an officer at a prestigious posting. The chapter has a lot more stories that, that women law deans share about their experiences, either about being presumed incompetent or gender sidelining where people mansplain or grow appropriate, engage in behaviors that we experience as part of the, the, the continuous microaggressions uh, that we push back against and, and, and still look at us. We thrive, we survive, write books, do great things in spite of that. And, and so the one closing thing I'll leave you with is imagine if we didn't spend so much energy dealing with the presumptions of, a, of incompetence and gender sidelining, what we could be doing. Thank you. Imagine indeed, <laughs> imagine indeed what we could accomplish. Um, and I love the terms in your chapter too. I don't think I had heard uh, grow appropriate, grow appropriate, <laughs> uh, but some really kind of interesting, um, um, uh, memorable, I think, uh, uh, terms. Um, Laura, let me ask you a, a quick question and then I, I'll try to rush to, to, to um, give the audience a chance to ask um, some questions. But one of the things that we see is that as um, women of color uh, start moving to um, uh, moving uh, closer to positions of power, we see a lot more resistance. Um, and so how do we create the, uh, the alliances that we need, the strategic alliances, and, and how do we kind of build support along the way when we're kind of on that trajectory? Yeah, it, it is absolutely a, cha a challenge because you know, we're getting to a point where, okay, we might accept we've got women of color in the, in the academy, but when you move into leadership positions, there's okay. just a whole different level of attack and pulling down. Uh, and so along the way, uh, you know, creating alliances and, and I was thinking about Sahar and, and you know, the seven prototypes and you really need to be familiar with, with the prototypes because there's no like one size fits all. But I think it's important, you know, within your faculty, you want to create alliances, not just with the, oh, Athena, what's the saying? The skin kin, like don't make assumptions. That, that, yeah, and everyone who's skin ain't kin, something yeah, like that. I mean, Somebody's gonna correct me. <laughs> we cannot make, you know, assumptions. I mean, li listen, learn, observe, um, and find points of commonality. So figure out like, who are the leaders who have a lot of sway, whether it's folks on the faculty, maybe it's on the board, maybe central administration, maybe you're getting those stretch assignments and you're on those committees that are part of the university. Uh, and then you establish your competence because you'll probably be presumed incompetent. Get on the committees, presume your competence, make friends, establish alliances, create common goals. Uh, and then sometimes it's about getting out there and getting on those committees where you're meeting donors. And when you get to know big donors and they like you, all of a sudden that gives you a lot of clout. And they might not be people like that look like you, of course. But you can establish common interest, you know, with almost anybody. At least that's what I typically think when we were having our our panel on the sixth, the LLS day, and I saw T-shirts that people were wearing in the Capitol. I'm like. I don't think I could find one thing in common, you know, with, with, but I think with most people, with certainly with donors and university administrators, there will be people you can establish alliances with, but it takes work. You need to be savvy. Don't make assumptions that certain people are going to be your friends and others are not. Uh, and uh, so, so be savvy, be patient, be strategic, be strong. Thank you. Thank you. That's a tall order sometimes. <laughs> uh, but, but thank you for that. I really uh, um, appreciate it. This has been fabulous. Um, and I feel like I've been really selfish because I've gotten all my questions in up front. So now what I'd like to do is turn it toward uh, the audience um, and start taking questions. And we're, uh, we've got a good 20 minutes. More people would like to stay around a moment or two. But, but um, if you all will raise your hands, on the um, 
on the, um, I'm sorry, um, on the Zoom function. Now, where do you go? You go into participants and um, I believe that will give you an opportunity to raise your hands. Am I right about that, Denise? Uh, yes, that is correct. Um, but to get us started, there is one question in the chat box if you want to start with that one, Athena. Okay, great. Let me take a look at it. I was following those for a while. Um, oh, question. I see it. Um, for Professor Badia, um, what are some of your favorite strategies to confront your colleagues or students' presumptions of your incompetence uh, just because you're a woman of color? This is not creative at all. And I'm really more at the point where Adrienne is in, in her career where, you know, we're almost on the way out the door. So uh, I, I feel completely different at this point than I did 29 years ago when I started. Uh, but I think one of those things, and I, I, I hate name dropping. I really do. I find it very off-putting when I meet other people and they name drop, but I have no problem dropping whether it's Stanford or this, or sitting on this board or this person, it just kind of gives you credibility in a way that, that I understand it's superficial. Um, I don't need it for myself. I don't need it like when I meet other people. I will, I, for me, it, it, it's, it's their content, right? But when you've got first year law students um, or colleagues, if that's what you have to do, it, it's simple, it's superficial, but it seems to work. Oh, she knows so-and-so. Oh, she went to, you know, fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. Oh, she's on this panel, right? So it's it's a silly thing, but I believe it's effective. Uh, thank you. Um, we also have a question from Alicia Jenkins. So um, you may have to allow her to. Her to... Ah, there you are. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm, my name is Alicia Jenkins. I'm, I'm located in Connecticut. I'm looking to be an academic. And um, my question is for Adrian. Um, do you know, or is there stats on how many um, Black women are in academia? Um, because there are people who are anti-Black in these establishments who are women of color. So I was just wondering um, how many Black women are there and specifically how many Black American women are there? Because I know America likes to say they have Black people in these spaces, but they tend to be um, Black immigrant, which is fine. But like, I wonder how many Black American women are in these spaces or are there stats for that? Yeah, I, I don't have that that number and i was wondering carmen since you carmen, were right. gathering these statistics if you had numbers for black but of course black is an umbrella group right and there's people who are from the caribbean people right. from africa people mm -hmm. who are in europe and so if we even then try to hone in on that how many are you know black american the descendants of slaves etc do you have any of that I do. Um, and this is not for legal academia, it's academia as a whole, and it's from the um, National Center for Education Statistics. Um, let me see, wait a minute. I have, let's see if I can break out the women. 13.4% Black African American. And let me see if I can find the women. Um, hold on. Hmm, no, I don't have the precise breakdown of every single group in front of me um, of the of the of the women. I can tell you about law deans if you're curious of the 29 women of color who are law deans out of the roughly, let me go back to that chart here for a second. Uh, out of the roughly 80 women who are law deans, roughly 29 are women of color, and of those 29, roughly 19 are Black women. So that's a little data. Mm -hmm. That's something. Um, other questions? So again, the, now I'm a little surprised because this audience was so active in the chat room. Um, and now I don't see a single hand. Uh, maybe one. Nope. No, don't see a single question. No can I, questions. Can I make a comment if we don't have questions? Well, I, 
I actually was going going to go there and uh, give the, give the panel a chance to uh, ask questions of one another. Uh, well, I just wanted to give some advice, and maybe you know, and others could could chime in with their advice. So first, I forgot to say that Adrian Wing is as I, I consider her one of my mentors, and I'm so grateful for all the advice she gave me while I was uh, a pre tenure. So thank you so much, Adrian. You you are. Um, she, she's been in Egypt many, many times, and I think that was part of her study abroad initiative. So I always feel like she's, she's kin in that regard as well, <laughs> an adopted Egyptian. Um, so one thing I would just tell, th this is how I uh, uh, approach things is, I think first you gotta figure out what game you wanna play, what race you wanna run. And sometimes you gotta run the dominant society's race just to get to a certain destination where then you can run your own race. Uh, a lot of it has to do with your power and your positionality in the hierarchy. And some people will say, no, from the very beginning, they will not run the other people's race or the dominant race. They find it too repressive. They take their chances and sometimes you win and sometimes you don't. The system is structured against you if you don't play by its rules. So you have to go in there with your eyes wide open. But if you do decide to play by the game, at least for some part of your career, um, one thing to, so you want to then think about how you can kind of beat them at their own game. So some of the games that are played, first there's the third party validator, which was discussed a little bit, is there, there is this very dysfunctional family process within law faculties where, especially if you're a woman of color, even a man of color, is if you're in the family, you don't, you're not in good. Right? It's almost like they take for granted people within their own faculties that may in fact be stars, right, within legal ac academy or within among policymakers or wherever their you know, area of expertise is. And so to the extent that you can bring in third parties that validate that um, by where you get invited, by people who, you know, there's, there's different strategies for that. It's unfortunate, but it, it is part of the dysfunctionality of faculty politics. Uh, the other is Use the, use the same tactics to your advantage. So one of the reasons why white men get cited so much and why they get invited to conferences to speak and get invited to contribute chapters and get, it's, be, it's not because they're the smartest, it's not a merit-based decision or selection process. And that's the big scam. Mm -hmm. And it's just who they know and they're friends and it's a good old boys club, it's tribalism at its core. So sometimes you just gotta play, get your own tribe. Say, okay, fine. Cause they're not gonna let you in their tribe. I'm telling you, at least not with a very, without a very high cost to your identity, to your authenticity, your dignity, and even to what you're, you'll write and research. So create your own tribe and say, oh, well, I got invited to this and I got, and, and so this is that network, right? Part of the people that are here, the, the minority section at ALS, you know, there are many different networks and as a result, if you are a woman of color who is tenured, who is a distinguished professor or endowed chair at a highly, or at a highly ranked school, you have a responsibility, right? We have a responsibility to be able to create those platforms for other women of color who are at other schools who may not be as highly ranked, who are pre-tenured, or who are seeking to go to the next level of their career because we become the validators. Right? By going and being invited to our school, to our symposia, to our conferences, to our faculty colloquia, you're helping them to be able to kind of, you know, talk to the hand, you know, oh, I, well, did you get invited to that school? I guess you didn't. And Maybe you're just not good enough. Sorry, I had a little attitude there. And that, that, I think that's wonderful. And I think that... Um, as you said, we do have a lot of organizations. So uh, that just reminds me, I think uh, Delgado and others wrote about the whole citation scheme years and years ago. Um, and so one of the things I always tell um, young faculty of color, um, you know, or I start asking them, have you been to LATCRIT? Uh, did you do critical race theory? If you are of the critical persuasions, are you in the AL section, minority section? Are you in these kinds of places? Um, because they will provide you a network, they will provide you support. Um, and if you're presenting papers there, um, you have a much um, better chance that those people will then cite you. They know your work is out there, they will cite you and you can build sites. And so uh, these networks and these organizations that we've established over time that we have or our 
elders have or um, those become really good uh, spaces for us to occupy both in terms of support and in terms of building our careers in terms of uh, citations if, if, if that's that's one of the things one of the things i'd like to ask each of you at this point um, perhaps to close us out um, Denise, I don't know if you're watching the chat room as I don't know if I'm doing a great job on that um, is for each of you I to <coughs> talk about and maybe this is a little self serving but um, what are some of the um, sustainability practices uh, that you use to kind of keep healthy and sane um, with kind of the, 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 the many obstacles um, that you encounter along the way what 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 do you what do you what do you do uh, just a thought and then i'll come back and ask a little more objective uh question and and so um uh carmen professor gonzalez i'd like to start with you i'm going to start with something that in, in some ways ties into the discussion that we have just had so you can look at that question on many levels part of it is what do you do with your own personal personal time? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Adrian talked about some of these, but what I have done, and I suspect everyone on this panel has also done, is I have found a safe space within my subspecialty with colleagues all over the world who are doing work that I value and who value my work so that in the world, in this world of, of craziness and hurdle jumping, I have a place that gives meaning for me. Um, where I am stepping away from the hurdle jumping and doing something that I think is valuable in and of itself, regardless of how it is interpreted by others. That safe space is what keeps me grounded in addition to what I do in my personal life. I'm fortunate to have a fantastic life partner. Mm -hmm. But that for me is the secret of my happiness in academia because I am in, in an area environmental law that is overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly male, um, where if I were to give people my scholarship, they would be scratching their heads half the time trying to figure out what to do with it. But when I searched broadly, and by broadly, I mean all over the world, I have comrades in arms everywhere. And that makes me feel very satisfied that I am leaving something behind that I can feel proud of and that has meaning. Wonderful, thank you. I'm gonna move uh, to, I'm gonna interrupt my process and come back to this to give you all hopefully the last words, but we do have two other, two questions. So let me take them and, and give our audience a chance to participate. So um, Camilo Romero, you have a question? And the second person to speak would be Marsha Griggs. I believe that's it, or, let's see, Marsha. Thank you, Professor Athena. I hope you can hear me. I'll take off the mask to be more clear. This hey, is my, my friend. <laughs> Hello, dear. Nice to see you all virtually. This is, this is my second class Brit event, and it's great to see such a room full of proud, strong women. And um, I can't help to wonder what is the role of us men, either in or consciously avoidant of academia, in helping to support this work. I realize there's very few of us on this call. I didn't expect that. And second, I think uh, Professor Padilla mentioning a little bit around the, the name dropping and the elitism of it. I'm wondering when we feel like there is a sense of tokenism, and I think especially now with the idea of institutions being a little more aware or woke, they're trying extra hard to bring in, you know, the, the most downtrodden to help show that, look, we're not so pale, male, and stale after all. I wonder how we may counteract some of that. There may not be some clear answers, but I'd be curious for your insight. And thank you for hosting. Great, so a question about tokenism. And Marsha, why don't you ask your question as well and then the panel can address it. Marsha Griggs. All right, hang on. <laughs> Hi there. Okay. All right, I, I put my question in the chat box. I didn't. Uh, so I just asked about, um, you know, experiences or recommendations from the panelists about, you know, women of color in particular, speaking for myself, who might be, you know, on the lateral market right now, you know, and from what I'm hearing from very accomplished people, you know, I'm gathering that the presumptions 
um, don't subside over time or, you know, with your scholarly records or things. So, you know, what advice, you know, would you have for someone who may have fought certain battles in their own institution, but as, as they look to adv advance or move, do we go back to square one or, you know, can we stand on, you know, some level of accomplishments or, you know, does it confront us all over again? Wonderful. Questions of uh, tokenism. Uh, who wants to address that? And then on the panel, anybody want to take a stab at that? I, I will. Can Great. you hear me? Yep. It's Adrian. Yeah, I put it in the chat. Um, you know, I'm willing to talk with people, to email, to phone with people about this because, um, you know, it's very specific what your profile is, where you're trying to go, what are the dynamics at that institution. It could be like as if you were starting from scratch, or it may not. It may be you're the token great grand poobah, you know, but you're still isolated and still disrespected. And so I, I, I put my email uh, in the chat. I'm literally willing to talk to anybody about any of this. And I've spent most of my career on faculty appointments in the last two years, I've happened to chair it at Iowa, but I know the experiences of, of many schools. So please follow up any of you who are interested in trying to maneuver the, the lateral, lateral world in this time period. And my thought is send me your resume. Yes. Oh, Thank absolutely. You. Send me your resume. <laughs> send, if you're gonna, send, you're gonna send, chat. Me your send me your yeah. stuff. <laughs> exactly. That, that's step one, because that, is the basis that everybody will use to determine whether you're going to fit. <laughs> right, right. Done. Anybody want to take on the token? Uh -uh. Marsha, oh, you had a follow up? I'll add something on the tokenism, and that is um, really the work that we're doing, the work that started with presumed incompetent, and, and even before that, it continues to this day, of creating a critical mass. So I certainly found in looking at women of color in leadership that you do hit a tipping point. It doesn't mean the problems go away, but once you hit a critical mass, you move from tokenism or a token to a critical mass. You know, we went from three women of color as law deans to almost 30 now. That's a pretty significant difference. Um, and it's harder for people to get away with things that they might get away with when you have a token, when you don't have a critical mass and you're working on your own. So um, there's no quick way to get from here to there, but I'm happy that we've gone from three women of color to, to almost 30 as deans and a lot more women of color uh, in the legal academy. So it's a starting point uh, it, because it is how uh, uh, we're being recorded. It is not good to be a token and to be isolated and to feel like every spirit injury is that you're the only one experiencing it. Once you start to get a critical mass, both the incidents start to decline. Uh, and as you share and you realize you're not alone, I think that is one of the one of the tools for sanity. That was another question that you asked about Athena is, is knowing that you're not in isolation, that you have allies, that, that you're not the only one that, it, that is experiencing this. So it's not a direct, it's not, it's not an answer because if I had the answer of how to, how to deal with the problems of tokenism, we could bottle it and we could sell it, but at least creating more of a critical mass um, and then having conversations because when you realize you're not alone or the only one experiencing it, it doesn't mean that that pain disappears, but it doesn't feel as personal just to you. If I could add to that, if you're in a position um, where you have some influence over the hiring process, simply as a faculty member because of your relationship with the university, the best practice is to have a cluster hire, not to hire someone who's going to be mm -hmm. isolated by themselves. That is state of the art best practices. And everybody knows that. And so if a university or a law school is not doing that, you have to ask yourself, what's really going on here? Is this here. a hostile place that has total turnover and has to have a new token every year? Mm -hmm. um, a related point, if you're on the lateral market and I just made a lateral move, so I've been thinking about this a lot, do your homework, 
make sure that the place that you're looking at is actually an improvement over the place that you are. And it's not just a question of numbers, it's a question of what is the institutional culture. You can have an institution that has a large number of, from the outside, it appears to have a large number of faculty of color, but they're all at war with each other and they can't do anything. And in fact, there are people who are poisonous and toxic. You do not wanna wind up in that environment. You wanna make sure you know what the situation is. Conversely, you can have a situation where there's a relatively smaller number of faculty of color, but they're actually incredibly cohesive and they work together to transform the institution. So always do your homework and understand that this isn't about merit, this is about cronyism. <laughs> the best candidate doesn't mean you're going to get hired. Make sure you have a connection in the institutions you're looking at, someone who can tell you the truth and who can be your advocate. So it's really about due diligence before you leap. And I, I just want to add quickly to what Professor Carmen said and, and Laura and um, Adrian, because I, I, I lateraled a few years ago and I echo everything that Carmen said, but one thing to look at it, you know, if you've, if many of us have practiced law before we went into the academy. And so it took me a while to figure out that this is really treated like a case. In other words, just like you have to know your judge, right? And you need to know your opposing counsel and you need to know what witnesses you're gonna to go to trial, what witnesses are gonna be called and what to expect. Because Carmen's right, it's not a meritocracy as much as it is a political game. And so the, 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 the two key gatekeepers are the committee members Right? They're the ones that are going to decide who to bring before the faculty, and that's a political decision. And a lot of it, you know, the faculties don't even know those conversations. Those are those are very siloed conversations. And deans, because they decide who's on the committee, and the decisions the dean makes signals to the faculty who they want, because we all know what certain faculty. I mean, every, every, Everybody, everybody has their own politics, everyone has their own cronies and their own tribes that they belong to. And so you tend to kind of see based on who's on that committee. So when you do your due diligence on the committee members, it gives you some idea as well as to not just what they research, but also the networks that they're tagged into. And then finally, if you get to be a finalist, you're interviewing before the faculty, you need to be prepped by insiders because it's all local. Ben, Benjamin Davis, Professor Benjamin Davis, another mentor of mine who is, I think has now officially retired um, from Toledo Law, wonderful person, um, you know, gave me that advice when I first started. He said, all, all faculty politics is local. It's all about your school, which I didn't really understand, but now I understand. So if you go get that interview, you've got to figure out, is this a faculty that they have a critical mass that cares a lot about theory or cares a lot about practice or skills and experiential learning, or um, it, you know, if you have two or three different works in progress or papers you can publish, you can present, which ones will that particular faculty find you know, more of interest? Uh, that's very local. Um, so, but but I, I echo what Carmen says is, yeah, don't, don't judge a book by its cover and don't always assume that the grass is greener on the other side. All righty, I think that has to be the last word. Thank you so much to um, all of the panelists, each and every one of you, you were fabulous. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day and schedules uh, uh, to do this. I, I just think this was a great, um, a great panel. And to all of you in the audience, thank you so much for coming out on a Friday <laughs> evening at six o'clock um, to, um, um, to participate um, uh, and to join us. And I hope you picked up some words of wisdom because I certainly did. Um, as one last thought, the next Class Crits uh, event will be on March 10th. Um, and there we'll be looking at the issue of racial capitalism. Um, and so with that, I'm going again, again, thank you panel. You all were fabulous. I appreciate it. Good night all.